Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Sarah Siegel, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Amanda Tyler, discussing her book, Justice, Justice, Thou Shalt Pursue, a life's work fighting for a more perfect union. She is joined in conversation tonight by Jeannie Sook Gerson. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events here on Zoom. And as always, our event schedule appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk today, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many as time allows. If you would like to buy a copy of Justice, Justice, Thou Shalt Pursue, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase it. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you for your support of community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link to donate in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for tuning in. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings this past year, technical issues may arise. If they do, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Amanda Tyler is the Shannon Cecil Turner Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, where she teaches and writes about the Supreme Court, the federal courts, constitutional law and civil procedure. The author of many articles and several books, including Habeas Corpus and Wartime, From the Tower of London to Guantanamo Bay, Tyler also serves as a co-editor of the prominent casebook and treatise Hart and Wexler's The Federal Courts and the Federal System. Tyler served as a law clerk to the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the Supreme Court during the October term 1999. She is joined tonight by Jeannie Sook Gerson, the John H. Watson Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Gerson teaches and writes on a wide range of subjects, including constitutional law, criminal law and procedure, family law, sexual assault and harassment, and Title IX. She has been a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and Harvard Law School Sachs Freund Award for Teaching Excellence. She's a contributing writer to The New Yorker. Tonight, they're discussing Justice, Justice, Thou Shalt Pursue, which is the result of a period of collaboration between Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Amanda Tyler. During Justice Ginsburg's visit to Berkeley, she told her life story in conversation with Tyler. In this collection, the two bring together that conversation and other materials, many previously unpublished, that share details from Justice Ginsburg's family life and long career. These include notable briefs and oral arguments, some of Ginsburg's last speeches and her favorite opinions that she wrote as a Supreme Court justice, many in dissent, along with the statements that she read from the bench and in those important cases. Without further ado, I will turn things over to our speakers. Amanda, Jeannie, the virtual podium is yours. Great, thank you. Um, welcome, Amanda, virtually to Cambridge. I know that you are, um, this is your second home. I hope that you feel that way. I, I certainly love having you here. Um, everyone, you should know that Amanda makes at least a once a year trip to the area. Um, Amanda, would you like to tell everyone the reason for that trip, apart from being a graduate of Harvard Law School? Well, I love to come and visit my friends at Harvard like you, um, but I also have occasion usually on Patriot's Day to be across the river running from Hopkinton to Boston. Unfortunately, I was not able to do that last year, um, but I'm very much hoping I'll be able to come in October. It depends if my qualifying time is fast enough, whether I'll get into the slim down Boston Marathon that will run this fall. But one way or another, I will get back there for the race. I've run it uh, 10 times in person and once virtually. And in person, I can attest, is much more fun than virtually. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, we look forward to it. And in the meantime, we're very um, privileged to have you here to talk about this new book of yours um, with Justice Ginsburg. Um, I have to confess that when I, I actually shed tears reading this book and you know, had kind of the chills running through my body um, from the beginning to the end. And I'm sure you, you do understand why and that you have heard that 
a number of times before by people who've had a chance to look at it and um, to read through the essays and also the pictures. Those were some of my favorite things, the pictures in the book, some of which um, are from the justice's private uh, collection that, that she made available for this book. And so I, I wanted to just start by asking you to tell us about the book. What, um, how did it come about? What is it? It's a, it's a collaboration between you and Justice Ginsburg that you um, completed before her death and now is being published. And this is a book tour that you would have done with her, um, but unfortunately are not able to have her with you in talking about it. So I, why don't we start with that? Yeah, it's, um, it's been a really emotional period to, to be promoting this book, but to be doing it under these circumstances without her, I would have uh, relished the chance to be sitting here with her um, or I guess on the computer with her um, under the circumstances, unfortunately, double unfortunately. Um, the book was something that we, you know, I'll, I'll start from the back and work forward or I'll start from the end and work to the beginning. We turned in a manuscript of the book project to the publisher three weeks before she passed away. And I thought that that's what the book was going to be, but then um, she did, pass away very tragically. And I knew that in the publisher said, we, we've got to contextualize this because the book's going to now be coming out after her death. And so I had to sit down and write an afterword. And that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. The first line of the afterword is exactly how I felt. This part of the book is not supposed to exist. And I, I would have given anything for her. I would give anything for her to be here now. Um, for so, so many reasons. Um, one of which is just what a fine human being she was. And the story of the origins of the book underscores that. If we go back in time, she was supposed to come to Berkeley to honor Herma Hill Kay in January of 2019. Now, who is Herma Hill Kay? Not everyone knows that name. She was a friend of the justices going back some 50 years. They were contemporaries in the legal academy and they had met and they had decided together with a third co-author to write the first casebook on sex discrimination in the law to effectively found the field in the early 1970s. And they had done this at the urging of their students at Berkeley and, and at Rutgers where the justice was teaching at the time. Herma was the second woman named to the Berkeley law faculty and our first woman dean. So she was my colleague when I joined the Berkeley Law faculty and my friend and my mentor, just like Justice Ginsburg was. And Herma died in 2017. So we created a lecture series to honor her. And I invited Justice Ginsburg to come give the first lecture. And I have to say, every time you invite a justice to do something, you always have a low expectation of whether they will accept. But I was quite bullish about this. I knew she would come. And sure enough, she said, absolutely, you name it, and I will be there because I will do anything to honor Herma. She was so, so uh, loyal and, and, and loved Herma so much. And so we set the occasion for her to come. And she was supposed to come in January of 2019. But she uh, was diagnosed with lung cancer just a month before and had to have surgery. So we had to postpone and given the context, given who she was honoring, she actually resisted me when I said, you know, we need to postpone, you need to heal, you need to stay home, you shouldn't be traveling. She really still wanted to come. And so then the fall comes, we had rescheduled for October of 2019 and she came and because again, she was determined to come and honor Herma. But what people didn't see, and, and it, you can watch the video of our conversation that is at the heart of the book, what people didn't see is behind the scenes how she was still struggling. She was still undergoing treatment for cancer. Um, in this case, her pancreatic cancer that was spreading. And she was not at full steam, but she was determined to come and honor Herma. Now that's all connected to the book because we learned at the time of her visit in the fall of 2019 that the University of California Press was considering publishing Herma's final work which is a book called Paving the Way, America's First Women Law Professors. And that is a book that uh, chronicles the stories of the very first women to enter the legal academy. 
Justice Ginsburg had written the introduction for that book in 2015, and she really, really wanted to see it published. She thought it was very important history to preserve. Um, these are the stories of the women who paved the way, not just for you and me, but also for Firma and for the justice who came in. You know, Firma was roughly the 15th and the justice was roughly the 19th woman law professor at an accredited law school. So these are the stories of the women who came before them. And we knew also that several publishers had turned down publishing the book, Herma's book, that is. So the justice got the idea that maybe we could turn our conversation into a book and we could present it to the University of California Press, which we knew was considering Herma's book at the time of her visit. And we could say, we'd love to do a book with you built around our conversation, but what we want is for it to come out alongside Herma's book. And to our collective delight, the press was only too happy to go for it, if as it were, and take the twofer. And I'm really happy to say that uh, both books are over my shoulder. They've come out together this spring, uh, Justice, Justice, Thou Shalt Pursue, alongside Paving the Way. And that's a sign or a, a story, really, of the justice's loyalty and how, um, you know, she was a tremendous friend and she was, she was very dedicated to her friends, but she also was someone who liked to lift up others. So she, she's lifting up Herma's work through our book, but she's also someone who wanted to honor the people who came before her. And that was a common theme in a lot of things that she did over the course of her life. And this is just another example in that regard. That's a great story about how the book came about. Um, I think your introduction in there is one of the most touching things I have seen. Um, and I think it's gonna be a challenge actually for the two of us not to like geek out about, <laughs> about all of Justice Ginsburg's um, cases and the doctrines. We'll, we'll try to keep, you know, have some mix of, of different, different kinds of topics as we go today. So I, I just, so I actually, I, I did not, of course, clerk for Justice Ginsburg, but in the year that I was clerking for Justice Souter, I did have a chance to actually spend an hour with her, um, along with my co-clerks in her chambers, um, when she invited all of us over for tea. And of mm -hmm. course, there were like at least three or four baked uh, desserts from um, her husband, Marty, laid out on the coffee table. And, um, and, the th and it was, me, I was the only female clerk and the other three were male clerks. And, and you know, I all the times that we had these gatherings with other justices, not Justice Ginsburg, I was always the law clerk that would just kind of put my foot in my mouth and say something like just because of nervousness <laughs> and just- I don't believe that, that. <laughs> I have to interrupt. I don't believe that, but go on. <laughs> you know, like asking Chief Justice Rehnquist at the time, like, oh, did you have a difficult confirmation battle, like not even having, you know, and of course he did. And it was just like, you know, it was that kind of thing. But with Justice Ginsburg, I was like, yes, she is my people. I know how to talk to Justice Ginsburg. Um, and in fact, it was true that it was extremely, um, it was amazing to me how open she was about talking about just go, getting right to, of course, my co-clerks felt really awkward because immediately in the first two minutes, I asked her about sexual harassment. And, um, and she was able to, and she, 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 I remember her saying uh, that she and Catherine McKinnon had very different views and yet they were extremely fond of each other. Mm -hmm. And that sexual harassment was a, a concept that every woman understood, knew, and yet there hadn't been a, a name for it. And I, I just remember hearing that from her lips and thinking, yes, this is, she was there when when all these concepts were being formed and it was, and she was integral to all those things. And as you know, I now teach family law. And so all of these different cases that she has been so, um, you know, so important in developing and either as litigant or as a justice are, are really, um, you know, part of what I think about on a daily basis. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, you know, I, I noticed that on, on, you know, really in the very beginning of your introduction on page two, it was, you mentioned the, the case of Mueller versus Oregon. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, and that's a case that I have, you know, spent some, spent some time with both as a teacher of constitutional law 
and as a family law teacher and as a teacher, um, you know, of, um, and, you know, a student of, of legal history. And so, and it's really interesting to me that in, that her approach in talking about that case is not the usual one, which is to really like kind of put it down as a way in which women were um, stereotyped and denigrated, which of course there was that in the case, but it was, it was, it's famous for the Brandeis brief, right? And, and that's, and, the, and then it, the book also includes an essay toward the end about the, the Brandeis brief, I guess it was a speech by Justice Ginsburg. Um, and so, and, and what's interesting to me is her brand of feminism and her brand of um, conceiving of equality for women. It was a distinctive one that came to feel natural. And then today we have, we have some, I think some soul searching that's going on about the exact kind of equality and the way in which Justice Ginsburg's vision was both prophetic and also um, difficult because it was exactly through the litigation of cases that wouldn't necessarily seem like the ones that you associate with gender equality, but that she made people understand that sticking up for the rights of men to be treated equally to women was central to women's equality. So I just wonder, you know, in your experience of Justice Ginsburg and, and working through these materials, how does that vision of women's equality sit with you today in terms of where we are in 2021? It's, you know, it's interesting. There are a lot of discussions, a, a lot of different parts of the book that touch on this, obviously. I mean, a, a huge arc of the book is primarily her work for gender equality. And you start, as you say, with Mueller, uh, it's a case about protecting women in many respects. And her work in the 70s was effectively work that said, you may think, you, the all-male Supreme Court, may think that women are the darlings of the law, that having the protections, in some cases, in, in almost all cases, the special protections of the law that limit our work hours or don't allow us to wait on tables on, uh, you know, in rowdy bars in Michigan, uh, those actually are holding us back in ways you don't realize because what the law is doing, and this was her theory in the 70s, what she was trying to convey and did so, as you say, very effectively through using male clients to tell their stories was that you're, you're sort of siphoning off and in reinforcing these gender stereotypes. And in so doing, you're not just limiting women, but you're also limiting men. So, you know, the classic example I would give is not actually one of her cases, but is a case on which she relies later when she becomes a justice, the Hogan case, which is a case about whether a man can go to a nursing school. And, and that's a case where she would obviously say, yes, if a man wants to be a nurse, why would we say he can't be a nurse? And the effect of striking down that classification is that it conveys that we're opening up opportunities for everyone. By the same token, you know, as I think your question highlights, she appreciated that even when you get rid of all of the relevant classifications, it's not like automatically all problems are solved. So among other things in the book, she talks about the problem, the ongoing and very serious problem of unconscious bias. And what's interesting, I think, about that part of the book is that she talks in particular about an example that is a legal example of a law in Germany that provided for government jobs if there's a tie between a man and a woman as to who should be hired for the position, the, uh, the law was the woman should be preferred. And there's a big debate that goes to the European Court of Justice about whether this is unlawful discrimination in its own right under the founding treaty of the European Union. And what the court comes to accept is that it's not, it's, it's the same thing. It's still trying to level the playing field and, and the rule, the law as it were, was trying to overcome as it was uh, the unconscious bias that the likely male interviewer would have to prefer the male candidate. 
And so I think she appreciated that on the one hand at the outset, we had to get rid of these clear classifications, this express discrimination, but that doing so wasn't going to make up all the ground. There was still going to be additional work that had to be done. And I also think she, she doesn't say this in that part of our conversation that's in the book, but later when we were compiling the book, as, as you've noted, um, there, are, there are a lot of dissents in there. And I think that that's her way, particularly the dissents in gender discrimination cases, that's her way of saying, actually, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of how the law treats women directly as well. Yeah, it's, I, I find it fascinating today. Uh, and I, I find myself constantly returning to the wisdom of her, her litigation strategy and her decisions and vision of gender equality, because I think we're re really still trying to grapple with, even this many year, decades later, what it means for the two sexes to be equal, and also in an era when we are more attuned to there being not just two ways um, of being gendered, right? What that, what that means. Um, because ultimately, I think that her vision of feminism and of women's equality was about affirming the humanity of each individual, like the right mm -hmm. of each individual to be seen as a human, as opposed to being seen as a particular gender first. And it's, I think it's just an, a very interesting conversation right now. Um, say, you know, someone of her granddaughter's generation, how they think about these things. And I, I actually uh, thought about it in, in light of this interview that she did with Jeffrey Rosen in the Atlantic um, a few years ago. And it was, um, sh she was asked about Title IX. You know, of course, she, she, she was pivotal in the interpretation of Title VII. And Title IX is very much um, the version of Title VII that is for, for about gender equality on campuses and in schools and in education um, specifically. And, and she was specifically asked about sexual misconduct processes at colleges and universities and whether she felt that there was anything um, to what people were saying, uh, some people, myself included, were um, pointing out that some of these sexual conduct procedures became unfair or they, they were working through fairness issues as they came on the scene um, as Title IX matters. And in the very much the rhetoric and the concept of protecting women, right? Again, that whole idea of protecting women, um, you had Jeannie, I can't hear you. I don't know what's happened. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Um, okay, I now I can hear you. you. Okay, now I'm back. Okay. Yes, sorry. Yeah. So this whole interplay between protection and equality mm -hmm. and how process also becomes a, a way to mediate those two concepts I thought was really brilliant in the way that she answered Jeff Rosen um, because she said, she basically said the person who is accused has a right to defend himself or herself. And if you don't give the accused person a fair opportunity to be heard, you know, that's just, that's just one of the basic tenets of our system that everyone deserves a fair hearing. And then, you know, and, and, and I think that the, the wisdom that I very much am influenced by in, in her thinking was that if you have due process and gender equality, they're not opposed, they're not opposed values in terms of today's debate about Title IX, which often tends to veer into like, oh, are you gonna have to have due process for males or are you going to have gender equality for women? And her answer, which I love, which is it's really not one or the other, it really is both. Um, and I think that that is, it's, it was such a clear, voice like 
you know, be to be able to articulate that at that moment, it was in 2018, three years ago, when people were really struggling, I think, with how do we think about gender equality? It was right after the Me Too movement. How do we think about gender equality? Obviously, we want to fight sexual harassment and sexual assault. And it just was such a simple and yet obvious way to say it once she said it. And I do think that that's, um, it's something that we are, are still struggling with, how to balance the need to protect vulnerable people. And, and she was definitely no stranger to highlighting the realities of life, right? It's, it wasn't all about formal categories. Um, and at the same time to affirm the values of process and fairness that ultimately our goal is to, it, the goal is to do that so that people can be treated as human beings, as individuals. Um, and so it's just, um, it's not something I find still groundbreaking, like when I think about it, that her gender equality theories are still in my mind groundbreaking even today. I actually, I'm, in some respects, I agree with you, but in other respects, I'm not surprised. And here's where I'm coming from in saying that. When you go back to the 1970s, she wrote a brief for the Supreme Court in Coker versus Georgia, a case I'm sure you know and you teach. Yes. And in that brief, she said, um, for those of you who don't know the case, uh, maybe you haven't had Professor Gerson's class in con law or criminal law or family law, it's a case in which the Supreme Court was deciding whether rape can be punished with the death penalty. And the rape laws, of course, are like Title IX, laws that are meant to protect women. And they are well-intentioned in that regard. The problem is in the administration. And she files a brief that opposes the death penalty as a punishment for, for rape pointing out how the penalty has been carried out and pointing out, for example, that there are huge racial disparities in how it's being carried out. It's primarily a punishment for rape by a white victim um, at the hands of a black uh, assailant. And she says, this is very problematic. This calls into question the legitimacy of the process. And so this is someone who cared very much about not just the protection of women by the law, and not just even equality, but also broader procedural integrity in the system. She's someone who, unsurprisingly, taught procedure as a law professor. And so for her, the inner workings of the procedure of the law, it had to have integrity for any of the product, products that really came out of what was happening to have integrity as well. And so against that backdrop, that's why I say I'm not actually surprised that that's the answer she gave in that context. Um, she was a lawyer's lawyer in, in many respects. Um, and then to your earlier point about gender identity, I think obviously her time as an advocate in the 70s, it was about men and women. And we live in a very different time right now. But what is so great about her jurisprudence in terms of the sort of core ideals that permeated not just her work in the 70s, but especially her opinions as a justice, is that she talks about how, not just in the context of gender, but more broadly, and, and this makes it house better uh, a scenario, or not a scenario, but our reality that gender is no longer one or the other. She talks actually about how the constitution should enable every person to fulfill their full human potential. And she talks a lot, and there's an opinion in the book where she talks about, we need law to allow people to chart their own destinies. And so there is, as you say, this real humanity to her jurisprudence that um, I think allows it to evolve as our own experiences evolve. So um, one topic that I love to hear about, and I hope the audience will also love to hear about because I'm gonna ask you about it anyway, um, is her husband. Um, and I, I just, I love the, uh, some of the, the stories that you have in the book um, about the, about when they went to the theater, for instance, in New York, maybe you could tell that one and then tell us some more Marty stories. 
one of my very favorite topics. Um, clerking for her when I did was a real privilege because it meant that you got to see the two of them. Marty was still alive and you got to see the two of them interact. And it was, and I've said this before, it was a love affair for the ages. It was just a joy and a privilege to see the two of them interact. And their love and respect for each other ran so deep and it was so transparent in how they interacted. But another part of watching them that was so much fun was how Marty would give her such a hard time. He, uh, he had a great sense of humor. And I should say as an aside, so did she. She doesn't get enough credit for that. But if you read the conversation in the book and if you actually watch it, you'll see she has an impeccable sense of timing and she can, she can bring the house down if she wants to. Mm -hmm. um, you had to have a sense of humor to be married to Marty Ginsburg. Uh, I tell the story in, in the book about how I first met him at a clerk reunion and he uh, it was my very first clerk reunion. This was the first time I ever met him. He crosses the room to put his arm around her and he's got a big grin on his face and I just assume he's embracing his wife. It turns out he's taped a sign to her back that reads Her Highness. And she walks around wearing this sign for a couple of hours before she discovers it. Um, and I just love that. He used to call chambers and ask for, is her highness in? Um, but he adored her and he was her biggest fan without question. When the story to which you refer has to do with right after Bush versus Gore, if you recall, she dissented in that case. And there were multiple opinions because everything had to be turned around so quickly. So she wrote separately. I don't know whether she would have otherwise because that was during a period where she often did not write separately in dissent. So she might not have, but in any that, event- That was your term, wasn't it? No, it was the year after me, the year, the year after, after me. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they went to a theater performance in New York or a music performance, I can't recall. And when the crowd realized that she was there, she got a standing ovation. And Marty leaned over, Marty, the greatest tax lawyer of his generation, leaned over and whispered in her ear, I bet you didn't know there's a tax convention in town. And uh, by his telling, she then proceeded to punch him in the stomach. So that gives you a sort of visual of what their marriage was like. But he, uh, he was just, you know, he was her biggest fan. She would not be, have been on the Supreme Court. Ron Klain has said publicly, if Marty had not proposed her and promoted her and, and really done the legwork to get her on President Clinton's radar. And this is someone who not just you know, promoted his wife and made, you know, gave her a hard time, he also doted on her. So uh, you know, a couple of other stories just quickly, but they're, they're so beautiful. I remember when I clerked for her, she had cancer for the first time. And it was, it was a really difficult year because she was in treatment throughout the period and you know, she'd had major surgery. He would come and he would come to chambers and say, you, it's time to go home. And he would literally drag her out of chambers. And then when we went to dinner at their house, he would prepare entire meals around what she could tolerate. And, and he was working very hard to keep her weight up. So I, I even remember specifically what he served when we would go over there. And then one of my favorite memories of him is when my husband and I were first married, we had them to dinner. And I remember they arrived and Marty, being Marty, he had baguettes under his arm because as he told me, no bakery in town can make a decent baguette. So he had just invented his own recipe and made his own baguettes. And he also had a flask. And I said, what, what's in the flask? And he said, well, it's Campari. As you know, that's her drink. She drank Campari and soda, that was her drink. And no one ever has it in their bar. And I said, Marty, I'm offended that you didn't, you know, didn't think that I would be prepared. I clerked for your wife. So if there's one thing she ever taught me, it was always be prepared. And so sure enough, he walked over to our, our bar and found a bottle of Campari and he was, he was just very, very happy. But the point of the story is this is a man, and I've learned this was a common thing, who everywhere they went, he carried a flask of Campari to make sure that his sweetheart could have her favorite drink. And I mean, I just love that. But that that is a window into what was just this grand love affair. Yeah, and I I assure you, and I'm sure you know that every every female who came near either of them um, instantly developed 
a crush on Marty Ginsburg as you know, the, the model, the model spouse to, um, you know, to, to uh, in, in, a, in the, that kind of marriage and in that era to have that kind of relationship between a, a woman fighting for equality and to be living that marriage with a man in that era was uh, in itself was I think a big inspiration to people of our women specifically um, in relationships with males in our generation, I think, just the, given what it represented in terms of, uh, and I, I know that one of the things she used to say is like, when asked for advice, like, how do, how do I, how do I think about my future and my career? And, and she was, she would emphasize the importance of choosing the right spouse mm -hmm. and one who would think that your work is as important as their own. And um, it is kind of shocking to me in 2021, you know, remembering even like what I felt like in when I was in college in the 90s and thinking, oh, by the time I'm 35, like obviously gender equality will be solved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and just how, when you look at what's, you know, true still in the league, obviously we've come a long, long way since Justice Ginsburg's days when she couldn't get uh, certain jobs and, and had to be really, you know, shoehorned into the clerkship by a, a mentor who really pushed and, yeah. and insisted and, um, and most women couldn't get such jobs, you know, she was like number one in her class, but um, it's still the case that when you look out at the legal profession at the, at the young lawyers who are out there, um, we're just really not anywhere near where I would have hoped for in terms of gender equality, especially even in our own profession, the one that Justice Ginsburg was such a pioneer in. I don't disagree. And I think, um, you know, she, she did say that you need to pick a partner who thinks your work is, is as important as theirs is. And the other thing that she celebrated about Marty and that she cited as a huge component to her ability to, to accomplish all the things that she did was the fact that Marty helped raise her kids. He had um, read a book or somehow had formulated this idea that the child bonds with the parent early on. And so you really need to be a presence in their life. And for that reason, and, and also just because he was the amazing Marty Ginsburg, he very much was a huge part of their family life in terms of helping her raise the children and supporting her career. And she has said, or she had said um, that women will never achieve full equality until men completely share the raising of children. And we still aren't, we still are not there. Um, you know, some women are lucky enough to have partners who do uh, take on that role and, and share the responsibility in some cases even stay home while their wives work. But you can just look at the statistics from the last year of the pandemic, and you can see with women fleeing the workforce, now there may be other reasons for that. Um, maybe women are in lower paid jobs. And so when it's between one or the other and someone's got to stay home, that's the one who stays home. But the raw statistics suggest that women are still the primary uh, family tenders, if you will. And, and they're the ones whose careers are perceived of as more expendable. So we, we definitely still have a long way to go in that regard. The one thing I really appreciated uh, coming out of this book as I, was, as I was reading it was just how we know that becoming Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the justice, that that's, you know, obviously she's an outlier in many, many ways and that she was so, um, extraordinary, starting from a young age as a law student and then in her profession that she really stood out. She was really just different in many ways, but there was also just this underlying theme of like, she had lived those experiences of not be having equal pay, she, of, of being pregnant and being afraid to be discriminated against, being actually discriminated against in employment 
and um, and living the life of a heterosexual marriage with a man and having to navigate what that would mean in terms of who did what. So all of the life experiences that do shape the law and our fight for equality as women, even though she was an extraordinary person that, you know, male or female, or you, you, you just, you can't sort of be like Justice Ginsburg, but she was like um, many people in actually having lived the very struggles that she was fighting for that she was fighting on behalf of. I think that was a big part of what made her such a great judge and, and advocate before that. It's everything that you say. She had been discriminated against as a woman. Her, her mother did not go to college because the family's money had gone to the brother. Um, so it even was discrimination that she knew going back generations. She'd been discriminated as a, as a Jewish person she had had tremendous adversity with the loss of a sister and the loss of a mother. And yet time and again, even as she continued to face this discrimination, she just sort of propelled herself forward, but she drew or she, she brought with her all of those experiences. She brought with her the experience of, as you say, and, and as she talks about in the book, uh, being the victim of pay discrimination in a job the same year that the Equal Pay Act is enacted. And she brought with her the experience of understanding pregnancy discrimination. She brought with her the experience of being um, a, a, from a religion that is that discriminated against and, and um, having, as you say, no, no job offers. All of that was a part of it. She also brought with her uh, the experience of coming from a working class background. And I think you see that in her jurisprudence. Um, when she talks, for example, about Lily Ledbetter's uh, inability to discover in the factory that she's the victim of ongoing pay discrimination. And she also talks about how hard it is when you discover that for you to get up the nerve to complain because you might be labeled a troublemaker and it might actually wind up being worse for your career to complain. When I interviewed her, and this is in the book, I remember very poignantly, I, we were talking about Go Cert and Cleary, a case involving uh, rules that didn't allow women to tend tables and bars at night. And there's a line in there where she says, but at night is when you get the best tips. Now, this is somebody who's lived a full life and who understands what it's like to wait tables, because there are a lot of people in this world, in the, in the echel upper echelons of the legal profession, who would not know that. <laughs> but that, of course, is true. And she knew that. And the other part of her experience that I think really shaped how she thought about America and that I hope comes through in the book is that she was the child of immigrants. She was the daughter and granddaughter of immigrants. And she gives a speech that we've included in the book at the end of the book where she talks about how special it is and how remarkable and, and how much we should celebrate the fact that a Supreme Court justice is the child of immigrants. And, and that also she's the daughter of a bookkeeper in the garment district. That's something really special, she says. And that's something that tells us a story about what is the American dream and, and what is, as she uses the phrase, the promise of America. And so I think what, again, going back to your term, Jeannie, of her humanity, I think that was all, all able to come across because it was all born out of all of those exp experiences that she, she carried with her throughout her life and, and to her time on the bench. Yeah, so before I turn over to questions, I just wanna make a comment and you can respond or not, up to you. Just, there was something really visually very striking about her, about her appearance, like her, her, her small stature and that she was very, you know, she, she looked very, you know, thin and very juxtaposed, very much juxtaposed with this incredible toughness, almost like this outsized toughness, um, like extraordinary toughness that she was known for in terms of like how she bounced back from her illnesses, mm -hmm. you know, didn't ever miss significant days of work, um, worked through it all. I mean, these are not normal, normal things that, that people manage to do. And it's, and, and then also just the workout there for her infamous 
workouts and, uh, you know, with her, her, her trainer. Um, and it's just all very, I don't, I think there was something to that visual image of like a, a woman who was, you know, small boned and, and, and not stereotypically, you know, in that way that she wasn't going to be pigeonholed and that she had a, you know, she was going to live her personality and her, her character, and that was of a really tough person, both physically and mentally. <laughs> I, I, I think of her as a tough person. I think of her as someone who was determined. And by that, I mean someone who was going to contribute. She, she once told my law students, if you have the gift of being here, in this case at Berkeley Law, same which I'm sure she would have said or did say at one time to your students at Harvard, then you have talents and you need to use them to contribute. You need to use them to make the world a better place and do something outside of yourself, she would say. And I think she recognized, she was a very self-aware person. She recognized that she was incredibly talented and she felt a determination and a pull to serve herself and to make a contribution herself. And no matter whether it was discrimination or cancer or adversity of any other kind, she just kept moving forward because she was inherently tough. And she was also really strong. I mean, it wasn't just that she did one arm push ups and planks and, and was the super diva that she was and doing her workout. She, she was actually strong. I remember going to the opera with her once, sitting in for Marty. He was traveling and she had me sit in front of her because it was an opera I had not seen before. And she was sitting behind me. And I just remember her putting her hands on my shoulders every song and she would clamp down and she was really strong. And I remember, you know, sort of crunching down, but the best part was then she'd whisper in my ear, this is my favorite song. And then the next song would come and she would do it again. <laughs> but she was, she, she really was very strong, but she was also, she loved opera and she, she just, she loved life. You know, she talks in the book about when you've been through cancer, you have, you, you have an appreciation and a zest for life you didn't have before. And I think that she, she carried that throughout her life. So here's a question from a member of the audience. Um, do you have a sense of how Justice Ginsburg felt about her larger than life persona and her resonance in pop culture and especially with younger generations? And I will add my own little little um, <laughs> curly cue to that, um, because I have the impression that she was a shy person. Um, you know, even as she was very outspoken in her work and very bold, that, that I had the sense that she, it's not like, you know, gregariousness wasn't, you know, something that, that came naturally. No, and I, I think we all had that impression until she became the notorious RBG. I mean, the law clerks, we, we sort of classify ourselves, we're in two groups, we're pre-notorious and post-notorious. And I'm a pre-notorious law clerk uh, who did not see this side of her. She, she, she was rather shy and, and reserved. And you certainly, uh, you would never describe her as gregarious, but she wrote this incredible tour de force dissent in Shelby County. It, oh, it's yes. just a magnificent, a magnificent uh, dissent. I am biased, but I, I think it holds up. <laughs> yes. and, uh, and, and it really spearheaded all of this attention. Did she like it? What did she think of it? I think at first she was really surprised. She didn't quite understand where did this come from. Over time, I think it amused her. And then I think she came to really appreciate some of the good things about it. So for example, I think she really liked that it meant that what she stood for, and also more generally the idea that if you see something that you don't like and that you don't think meshes with your core values, you should speak up. She really liked that all of that was being transmitted to younger generations. Mm -hmm. And so I remember at the, you know, one of the last times that I was in her chambers, I remember she had a picture on her desk and it was a picture of her in her robe with a collar and she was standing with a little girl who was in a Ruth Bader Ginsburg costume. And I think, you know, she had that in a very prominent place. And I think it was because 
she was really energized by how her work and her example was inspiring younger people. And it's one of the reasons why after she passed away, I added a picture to the book. I added, an, I added a few images to the book that have to do with her passing and her lying in repose and lying in state. But I also added a picture of a little girl who came to pay her respects to the justice. Mm. And she's wearing a Supergirl costume and she's mm. saluting the justice. And I just, I absolutely love that picture. And I think she would have loved it because that was the best part of the Notorious RBG is that that little girl knows who she is and hopefully will be inspired to keep that work going. I always wondered when I was watching Saturday Night Live and, and Kate McKinnon's impression of her, I, I always wondered like, has she seen these? <laughs> someone, someone showed her and she thought it was very amusing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Shelby County, her, her descent in that case, I, I was just looking at it today because for, we've been thinking, of course, about voting rights mm -hmm. a lot and what's been going on with restrictions on voting rights and efforts to expand um, to ha give equal access to voting for minorities. And it's, you know, it's a fight that we're going to be fighting for, for quite some time. And I do think that that Shelby County descent um, absolutely does stand up and we will be returning to it um, kind of as a touchstone as we go forward. Now, speaking of dissents, Justice Scalia was the only dissenter in her famous case, the v VMI case, which, you know, if, if there's kind of a trademark for, you know, one case that people um, should know, I think it, it's probably VMI. Um, and, and he's the one, you know, and he's her friend and the one dissenter in that case, which is like her case. And so I guess the next question from an audience member, you know, after that intro by me, how were they able to be so close despite their irreconcilable ideological differences? You know, I get this question a lot. And I, I think it's a great question because of the times in which we live. They often talked about their friendship and what they said was that we start with the common ground and the common ground is what binds us together so we both love our families we both love opera we're both from new york he was from queens she was from brooklyn and we both love our country they would say we both revere the constitution they would say they may interpret it differently and indeed they interpreted it incredibly differently but they had this presumption of good faith that they held the each, the each, each of them to have. Sorry, I've jumbled that. They believed that each other was operating in good faith and that they had the same overarching core values. And I think that went a long way for them in terms of- I think it went of, a long way for all of us, honestly. Yes. See the other through each other's eyes. Yes, yes. And the other thing that she talked about she gave a speech at his memorial that is really spectacular. And she talks about how much she loved him and what a great friend he was, how funny he was. But then she actually says, and sparring with him was actually good. Not only did I enjoy it, it made me better and it made my arguments better. So she talks about his descent in VMI and how he gave her an early preview of it and how grateful she was for that because it allowed her to shore up her opinion holding that the state of Virginia had to open VMI to female cadets when it did not want to. And he had dissented saying, no, they could maintain separate colleges for women and men. And she said with every, going, every round going back and forth with him, she was able to make her arguments stronger because she was able to confront and take on and explain away the best arguments on the other side. So I think that was also part of it. It wasn't just that they enjoyed sparring intellectually, which they clearly did. It was also that, at least in her view, she thought having him as a foil enabled her to be a better lawyer and to make better arguments. And I think that's also a really important lesson to take out of their friendship. And it, I think it is, it's a, that friendship and that principle that you just articulated, I think it's very, for us as law professors, it is very central to the way we, we teach students. Yes. That it's, yes. That that's where that's where it all comes from. The idea that you take the other as coming in good faith, and you have the beliefs you have and the reasoning that you have, and it may be 
altered or it may be refined, but it is always in relation, um, not only in opposition, but in relation to the other. Yes. So, um, okay. So another question from someone in the audience is, is there anything that as you were working on this book, is there anything that surprised you to learn about RBG in terms of her career or her, her life while working on this book? Quite a few things. I know in the interest of time, I need to be brief. So I'll, I'll pick two. One is, um, you know, I asked her, and, and this is in the book, were you thinking about being a lawyer when you were a kid? Because you would just assume that she was with, with, with how her life unfolded and also knowing that as a, I think, 13-year-old, she wrote an article for her school paper where she talked about Magna Carta and the UN Charter and various other, uh, the Bill of Rights, I think. That sounds like a lawyer in the making. And she said, no, because there, there just were no women lawyers mm -hmm. and, and women weren't, weren't in the law. So that just was inconceivable to me. And, and that's really striking to me that it's only later in her life where she starts to actually think about I could make a profession in this. And the other thing that was really interesting was learning about, and I'll try to, sit, to do this briefly, a case that she had litigated in the 70s about which I was not aware. That was a case challenging segregated along gender lines, high schools in Philadelphia, a case called Vortimer. And she talks about this in the book. It's a case that there's a long and tortured story as to why they wind up losing in the Supreme Court and the separate high schools are upheld. That is the same issue that is central to VMI that comes before her 20 years later as a justice. And I'd always assumed and known from limited conversations with her that VMI was really special to her because she got to cite the precedence of all the cases that she'd won in the 70s. What I didn't realize is that it was the continuation of a, of a case that she had lost in the 70s and that that brought all of that work full circle. And I think you know, if this is, if, if this is the, the last thing I'll say, I think that's indicative of why she was so optimistic because there and in so many other ways she had seen over the course of her lifetime how much progress could be made. She wasn't, um, it, she wasn't unaware, and this comes through in the book, that there was still a great deal of work to be done, but she also was very proud of, of how much progress we, we had made and, and that she had participated in accomplishing. Amanda, thank you so much. This was a really enlightening and, and wonderful conversation. And I really, I just loved it. I loved reading the book and thinking about RBG and also your wonderful comments throughout and, um, and the touch, the, the gentle touch, the very discerning eye that you had as you know editing this book and putting it together and all appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to be in conversation with you, Jeannie. I wish that we were doing it in person though. <laughs> Next year. Next year. <laughs> thank you so much again to Amanda and Jeannie for your time. And thank you all for tuning in and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. If you would like to support Amanda and the bookstore, click the link in the chat to purchase Justice, Justice, Thou Shalt Pursue. We sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone.